back. I appreciate Brian uh, mentioning Mission Sunday. As we know, we're building up to July 14th, which is coming up. Hopefully you've been uh, paying attention to that and praying for that already. We have a big goal of $738,500 that we're hoping to collect on that one-day special contribution. I hope that you've been uh, visiting mrcc.org slash Mission Sunday to learn more stories, read more stories about how God is working in unexpected and unlikely ways all around the world. Of course, we have some printed materials for you to pick up each week. You know where to get those. We've got those here on the stage at the back of the room out at our Mission Sunday display. You can get your posters and your glasses and your regional cards, and so those are available for you today as well. Today's regional focus is on Africa, and so in our contribution on July 14th, we've got different areas that we will be giving towards. One is in Tanzania, where we, where we will be supporting the Nima Village. Nima Village is a home for babies and for mothers and for others who are undergoing medical problems, and so it is an infant care center. They do a wonderful ministry there uh, for orphans and for widows and for young moms, and so so we are pleased to support the work that they do at Nima Village through our Mission Sunday offering. And then in Kenya, for many years now, we have been supporting work in Mombasa and a number of evangelists and ministers that we support to lead the many churches that we are connected to there will be included in our contribution and also our Mombasa Reviving Missions Project that some of our leaders there in Mombasa are engaging in. Brian, in addition to leading our thoughts this morning around the Lord's table, is also our Mombasa coordinator. I invite Brian to come on up. Tell us a little bit about our focus story for this morning and also uh, introduce a video that we'll watch, and he's going to lead a prayer after that. Thank you, Andy. Um, I was trying to get your uh, microphone, and I realized I already have one on. Um, so we got to talking the other day, and uh, this church... And thanks to many of you all who are sitting here towards the front. Uh, many of you all have helped Memorial Road support missions in Africa for over 35 years. And when you think of that time frame, you know, we, we're a generation, well, maybe it's just me, we expect immediate gratification. If we give something, I expect something right there. You know, if Chick-fil-A doesn't get my stuff fast, you know, then something's wrong. But there's a lot of times when we look at contributions, missions in particular, um, outreach, the seeds that you plant today, they may not germinate. You may not see anything for years and years later. So we're going to actually watch a video um, here in just a second um, that one of our evangelists that we support, and you see salaries up there, uh, Georgia Chongwe is one of our missionaries from Mombasa who now works at the Nairobi Great Commission School. And his video is, I think, a great example of how your contributions, the contributions that you've made that have given people water to drink at church, that have literally built the churches there, have built schools, have educated generations of children, so that not only are they able to read and write, but they know about God. Um, they support, you support prison ministries. Uh, hospital ministries. It's amazing the amount of evangelism that these folks do, and it really, frankly, is humbling. Um, when I speak with George all the time, I realize that those folks over there through your contributions is simply, some, sometimes as simple as World Bible School leads to amazing things. So watch this video with us, with us real quickly, and uh, then we'll have a short prayer for the work there. Welcome, Brother Charles. Thank you so much, Prince Paul. Please introduce yourself and let us know when you got saved and what happened afterwards. Amen. I'm Charles Youngworth. Yes. I come from Uganda. I became a student of World Bible School in 2000. And as we were studying with the, those who we were studying with, we understood what the Church of Christ is and what a Christian is according to the Bible. And we became the first church in Anyang in 2006. Mm -hmm. Now we have several thousands of students of World Bible School. There are now 30 congregations in the northern Uganda. We have close to thousands of members. A thousand yes. members. A thousand members. Since 2006. We have been able to cross into Congo with the WBS materials, the French mm -hmm. lessons, and now we have three congregations in Eastern Congo. Now I'm an alumni of Nairobi Great Commission School. I love this school so much, mm -hmm. that's why I am here to request for mission practicum if the school can send students to work in our area in Northern Uganda. You know, this is how God works in a unique way. 
2006, a student of World Bible School, they plant a church, and that church has 20 members. Today, they have 30 congregations from one convert of World Bible School, and they have more than a thousand members. And that is not enough. They have crossed over to the Republic of Congo, what on Congo, to begin congregations. And if there is a way that God works, I consider that to be a very unique way. Support missions, because God is about missions. Thank you. Tell, can you tell that these men have a zeal for Christ? It, I, I, when I say I'm humbled, most of the time when I talk with them, I feel like I'm doing, I'm not doing that good of a job. Um, these guys are out in very difficult situations. You heard um, taking the cause of Christ, not just from Mombasa where it started, but from Nairobi into Uganda and into the Congo. And I don't know if you know much about um, that region that has, has had terrible civil wars. Um, in northern Kenya and all those areas, you have a, a, literally a persecution of Christians. But yet they are true evangelists there in Africa. And that's what your support does. So pray with me now as we uh, uh, go to God. Dear Lord, we're continually amazed and humbled at your wisdom, your knowledge, and your hope in us. We pray to you today that you see in us the joy, the zeal, the love of you that we see in these brothers in Africa. We pray that you touch our hearts daily so that we continually look for ways to be involved in missions. As George said, you are missions. You teach us, you guide us, and frankly, you command us to bring your message of hope to souls around the world and across the street. Lord, this morning, we humbly thank you for all the blessings you have given to us. Help us to not take those for granted, but to continually look for ways to help others. Help us to be missions-minded. Dear Lord, we praise you, we love you, and in your Son's holy name, we pray these things. And all the brothers and sisters in the church said, Amen. Well, good morning, church. Super glad to see you this morning. Let me say this. Uh, some of you might have come to our VBS last week. We had our uh, first VBS evening of the summer. We're doing it in three different uh, days throughout the summer instead of three in a row. And I met a lot of guests last week. So if you're one of those guests and you're joining us this morning, I just want to extend a really big welcome from myself and the elders and the staff and everybody here at Memorial Road. It's, a, it's actually a really unique time to, to attend Memorial Road. The contrast between what happened last Tuesday and what happens today in many ways uh, is a snapshot of who this church family is. If you were here with us last Tuesday, we love children. We, we have one of the best children's ministries in, in, the, in the state, in the country. It's one of the big values of this church family. In just a few minutes, we're going to be honoring our senior Christians, especially those who've been married for 50 years or longer. Well, we at this church family view that as a strength. Some churches skew young and some churches skew old. And one of our great advantages and strengths is that we have equal representation from every generation. And that's what makes or one of the reasons uh, that worshiping with this church family is really unique. And so we're, we're just thrilled that you're with us this morning. One of the things that I enjoy doing at, as a minister is, is doing weddings. And part of the reason I like weddings is because I think weddings are, are kind of like life. Because in a wedding, on the one hand, there is immense planning that goes into a wedding. People start planning their weddings six months in advance. Some people start planning their weddings a year in advance. There's some of you in the room, you're not even dating anybody, and you're like already planning your wedding. Like we, we spend so much time and energy planning weddings, and there's so, there's so many details. You've got the, the center pieces, and you've got the bridesmaids, and the groomsmen, and the flower girl, and the ring bearer, and you've got to figure out the venue, and the DJ, and the music, and there are so many details to a wedding. So on the one hand, a lot of planning for a wedding, but on the other hand, it rarely goes the way you think it's going to go. There's always a plan B at a wedding. So, so for example, several years ago I did a wedding. It was a beautiful 
facility, one of these uh, uh, old opera house type places, and there's organs built into the walls. So the pipes are everywhere. Gorgeous wedding. Bride walks down, and they play the traditional song through the organ pipes. She gets to the stage, and one of the reeds from one pipe amongst all of them gets stuck. And so she's standing there ready for the ceremony to start, and there's one really loud note, just like E flat, just super loud. It's like a fire drill, and her face turns uh, the shade of a tomato. And uh, she gets really angry, actually, and I'm the only one that she can target her blame at. And so she, she looked at me and said a few things. And anyway, then uh, it finally went off, and uh, we got going, and, and, and the wedding turned out fine. But life is like that, too. You can make all the plans that you want for life. You can plan your job. You can plan your summer vacation. Uh, you can plan your summer schedule. You can plan out your years of retirement. But then life happens. You get sick. The air conditioner breaks. It rains for 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> that's, just, <laughs> that's just life. So I love how weddings are very similar to life. Here, here's one thing that a lot of couples don't realize when they get married. They spend so much time planning the wedding that they forget to focus on the health of the marriage. Marriage is hard. And so sometimes when we spend so much time at, on the spectacle of the wedding itself, we forget to focus on what marriage is really all about. And it is hard. And so what we want to do today is to honor the people sitting in the front of the room. Uh, you all have been married for 50 years, and that is a remarkable achievement to have lived with, looked at, shared a bathroom with the same person for 50 years. It, it really is quite an achievement, and Scripture tells us to give honor to whom honor is due, and so we want to do that today. And so in just a moment, I'm going to read uh, arguably the 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 most famous passage in Scripture about marriage. There are several, but I'm going to read Ephesians 5 in just a few minutes. But let me say this. The challenge anytime you honor one is the reality that you can also dishonor another. And so I know that even as I introduce the topic today, some of you are thinking, well, I'm not married and I want to be. Some of you have been divorced and just the thought of marriage makes you relive the ache of that loss again. Others of you, the last time we did a celebration of 50 years of marriage, you were married. But since then, your spouse has died. My grandmother is in that group, Betty Brookman, one of the heroes of my, my faith. Uh, she was married for six, though this year would have been 68 years for her and her husband, but he died a year ago. And so I asked her, I said, would you mind just writing down some thoughts of encouragement to share, especially for those of us that, that might not feel thrilled about celebrating uh, others' achievement? And so here's what she wrote. She said, from someone who has lost her husband to those celebrating 50 years of marriage, I say, that's wonderful. You're not only obeying God, you are an example. Be thankful and count your blessings because time is precious. Think about and be thankful for the things that you do have, not the things that you do not have. I have many blessings. So be kind and be sweet and be cheerful and thoughtful to others. And tell your mate that you love them and give them a kiss and hold hands. It's pretty wise words from a pretty amazing woman, and I love how she puts it, you, you can actually be grateful and be grieving at the same moment. And that's actually a sign of Christian maturity. So Ephesians chapter 5, Paul writes these words. He says, wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. So did you catch the heart of this passage? 
for wives in the audience that the way you treat your husband derives from the way you treat the Lord. And the key act in this passage is the act of submission. Now, oftentimes today we think about submission as a, a something that makes you weak. In fact, the opposite is true. It takes immense strength to submit. I mean, think about when it comes to you and your walk with God. If you're like me, my will and God's will are on opposite ends of the spectrum. And so it actually takes an act of strength when I die to myself to choose God's will over my will. So when I'm weak in my flesh, when I'm tired, when I'm, when I'm hungry, when I'm afraid, those are not the moments when I submit to God. When I'm weak, those are actually the moments when I make decisions for myself. You see, submission actually requires strength. When I am at my strongest, my submission is actually at its best. And so wives, submitting to your husbands does not make you a weak woman. It makes you a devoted woman. And sometimes submission is exactly what your husband needs for him to do his job. For example, Tim and uh, Kathy Keller wrote a book on marriage. And in this book, Kathy is reflecting on a big decision that Tim had to make. Tim was a professor before he became a very well-known preacher in the state of New York. Well, Tim had been praying about whether or not to go start this church in Manhattan. And Kathy said, Tim, I don't want you to do that. They were raising three boys at the time, and Kathy did not want to raise her boys in uh, the heart of New York City. And so Kathy writes about this uh, in this book about marriage. She says, uh, the first phrase here is from Tim. Tim replied, well, if you don't want to go, then we won't go. However, I, Kathy, I replied, oh, no, you don't. You aren't putting this decision on me. That's abdication. If you think this is the right thing to do, then exercise your leadership and make the choice. It's your job to break this logjam. It's my job to wrestle with God until I can joyfully support your call. So there's a speech for you wives that you can give to your husband next time. <laughs> you guys are making a big decision. Now, some people might, might say, well, she's not standing up for herself. Well, th- this is just an outdated version of, of marriage. No. Kathy is following Ephesians 5, and that took a lot of strength for her to submit. She's not a weak woman. She's a strong woman, and yet she is submitting to her husband. So Tim Keller decided to go to New York. It was a really hard decision, and he would say he was very scared to do this, and Kathy reflects on their roles. She says, at that point, Tim and I were were both submitting to roles that we were not perfectly comfortable with. But it is clear that God worked in us and through us when we accepted our gender roles as a gift from the designer of our hearts. So each one of them had a role, and they lived into that role. Now, speaking of men, back to Ephesians 5, here's what Paul says next to the husbands. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. What a powerful passage. It's a comparison. Husbands, love your wives in the same way that Jesus loved the church. Well, let's think about that for just a minute. Let's rewind 2,000 years. How did Jesus love his church? original followers, like the disciples and and, and the women and the other people that followed him around. Like, what were those people, what were they like? Well, well, if you remember, especially in the final scenes of Jesus's life, on the one hand, some of those people did some pretty remarkable things. Like, you've got Peter, and he's really bold, and he's saying, I'm going to die with you, Jesus. And he takes his sword, and he cuts off this guy's ear to protect Jesus. So, So that's good. And then, and then you've got uh, this woman who anoints Jesus before his burial, pours perfume on his head. That's, that's good. So, so in some ways, his followers are doing the right thing. 
But on the other hand, if you, if you remember, Judas betrays Jesus, and then Peter denies Jesus, and then everybody abandons Jesus in the garden. And yet Jesus dies for them anyway. Meaning Jesus did not die for the church when the church was at her best. Jesus died for the church when the church was at her worst. In fact, just, just play it out in kind of the big picture of church history. Think back to the last 2,000 years. What's, what's happened? Has the church at large, like I'm talking about people of God from the last two millennia, has the church, the bride of Christ, have we done wonderful things? Absolutely. Most educational systems derive from the church. Most hospitals find their origin in the church. The, the church has, has fed the hungry. The church has served the poor, the church has tended to the sick. We have done so many good things. And yet the church is also responsible for the crusades, if you know your church history. Where people marched around slaughtering others in the name of Jesus. Or, or on a more individual level, we have lied and we have cheated and we have stolen even from each other. And yet the point here is Jesus still loves us, and Jesus still died for us, not when we were at our best. He loved us and died for us when we were at our worst, because Jesus loves us, not because of what we do. Jesus loves us because of who we are. We are his bride. And what Paul's getting out here is he's saying, husbands, your job is to love your wife the same way that Jesus loves his bride. That is a very deep love. So husbands, are you called to lead? Absolutely. You, you are the head of the marriage, as Scripture says. But in the same way that submission requires strength, so leading requires love, deep love. And so, so what this means is that you, you love your wife. Yes, you love her when she gets that big promotion at work. But you also love her when she gets in that fender bender. And this means that next time your wife cooks you this amazing steak dinner, yes, you love her for that. But also love her when she orders that $200 thigh master at one in the morning without telling you. You, you got to love her. You love her when she's happy. You love her when she's sad. You love her in her Saturday pajamas. And you love her with her Sunday best. You love her in the same way that Jesus loved you. Next verse, verse 28. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Now, what is he getting at there? Well, it's probably what you think he's getting at. This is one of those doorway verses where he explains it more fully in a different part of the Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul writes this, The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. This is important here. Do not deprive each other. Why? So that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You see, Satan has a lot of strategies in breaking up marriages, and one of the primary ways he attacks is in the bedroom. You see, sex is a gift. It's God's gift to marriage. And this is not just my opinion. I'm not just quoting you a great recent survey. I'm not just offering you some modern psychological advice. This is from the Word of God, and Paul thought it was important enough to write about it. And think about this. I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way. Paul's single. And so if anybody had the right to say, well, I don't really want to put that in Scripture. I don't really want to say that. This doesn't really apply to me. This isn't really in my life. It, it would have been Paul. Like, Paul didn't have to write this. Paul could have said, I don't really relate to these married people. But he does put it in there. Because Paul, even though he's not married, he knows healthy marriages lead to healthy churches, and healthy churches lead to kingdom growth. And so he brings it up. 
He's saying to couples, guys, I know this sounds strange because I'm a single guy. Might sound awkward coming from me, but what Paul is saying is open this gift, use this gift, because if you don't, Satan will attack you. Sex is God's gift to marriage. I want to give you one practical prayer, and then I want to, to honor the people sitting right in front of me. Here's a really practical way to apply Ephesians chapter 5. One really simple prayer that you can start praying for your spouse. Here it is. God, love, fill in the blank, through me. And you can apply this not just to marriage. You can apply this to anybody that you love, anybody in your family. So for me, it's God, love, marry, through me. And when you start praying this prayer, you start following through. You start seeing your spouse differently. You start looking for opportunities to love and to bless them, not because you have to, but because you, you want to, because you realize that it's not even you doing it. It's God's love coming through you to bless the person that you love so deeply. God love blank through me. So that's some talking about marriage. Now let's do some honoring. I want to pause, and I want to honor the people in front of me this morning. You've been living these principles out for years, and as my grandmother wrote, we need examples. We need spiritual examples of people who have devoted themselves to God. We need financial examples of people who have been wise with their money, and we need examples of people who have done the wonderful work of marriage for a a long time because it gives us hope. So I'm, I'm going to read a list, list of names. Not everybody is in the, in the audience today, but, but a lot of them are. And so what we're going to do is, uh, there's 92 couples, 92, which is amazing. This is a blessing. So to break this up, we're going to applaud and celebrate at the end. But we're, I'm also going, I decided this morning, after I get through the decade of the 50s and before we hit the 60s, we're going, to, we're going to do an intermission celebration. So we'll, 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 we'll do that. And th- these are listed in order of how long they have been married. So first off, Jerry and Nalene Sandberg, Terry and Vicki Klingman, Larry and Glenda Urban, Rex and Betty Hardeman, Gary and Paula Childers, Wayne and Karen Whaley, John and Connie Maple, Charles and LaJana Johnson, Bill and Kathy Thompson, Dean and Janine Bryce, Lee and Jan Williams, Ray and Suzanne Vaughn, Mickey and Jane Bannister, David and Linda Smith, Dan and Joanne Hayes, Ralph and Brenda DeBoard, Russ and Jan Hannon, Kenny and Kathy Kaihello, Lon and Jane Winton, Jim and Marilyn Buchanan, Bill and Doreen Seeger, Leon and Janice Shoemaker, Terry and Kay Hale, Bill and Carolyn Edwards, Dan and Donna Jones, Pat and Jan O'Neill, Landers and Helen Jones, Dwight and Sharon Rosenbaum, Charlie and Joy Cleek, Quentin and Helen Martin, Benny and Margaret Whaley, Chuck and Phyllis Russell, Dick and Aloma Anderson, Jim and Joy Dupee, Phil and Marilyn Lewis, Don and Carol Winkleplek, Larry and Linda Scott, Buddy and Janice Hannon, Les and Maureen Newman, Jajun and Sufin Zhang, Dick and Dorothy Whitley, Doyle and Gerilyn Beverly, Art and Sandy Sheldon, Don and Nancy Nancy Jane Friesen, Kenneth and Sadie Hild, Garrett and Lucky Fecht, Lynn and Joy McMillan, John and Sue Draper, 
Dennis and Margaret Heitman, Bill and Glenn Nell Hester, Frank and Judy Davis, Leon and Pam Oosley, Ivory and Maxine Grayson, Bob and Karen Harmon, Bill and Linda Wilson, John Paul and Jeanette King, Bill and Pat Downs, Lanny and Floyd, Floyd Smith. Let's give this first set a round of applause. So we're, we're over halfway done. And now the, the, this next set of, of people are 60 years of marriage and more. Lauren and Iola Giger. Daryl and Mary Nell Chabonneau, Ralph and Barbara Courtney, Richard and Ellen Brewer, Daryl and Linda Alexander, Hank and Pat Cloud, Ivan and Doyleen Johnson, Joe and Lottie McCormick, Lloyd and Sharon George, Danny and Janice Lighty, Tom and Joy Hardiman, Terry and Beverly Norman, Peter and Naomi Patton, Gary and Dee Fields, Lewis and Barbara Bodie, Clyde and Gwen Antwine, Ken and Mary Knowles, Robert and Loretta Ham, Stafford and Joanne North, Jim and Norma Freeman, Richard and Marilyn Hankins, Jim and Ann Rogers, Bob and Nova Elliott, Bill and Joanne Hurst, S.L. and Betty Mullins, Bud and Sarah McFarlane, Bill and Sue Wilson, Howard and Marilyn Leftwich, Jess and Harriet Van Hooser, Dexter and Virginia Holliman, Virginia and Loretha Walker, Ralph and Gladys Bertram. Tom and Joe Keith, and then the couple at this church family who's been married the longest is Wendell and Gay Hughes at 72 years. Let's give a round of applause for all these couples. I ask for forgiveness for all the mispronunciations that I made <laughs> during that reading. But I do want to say th thank you for showing us what commitment looks like. You've been through a lot, a lot of good, a lot of bad, but you kept your promise. And we feel blessed by that. The final verse in Ephesians 5 is when Pi uh, Paul says this. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. So I want you to imagine in your mind one of the couples that's sitting before us today that I just read. I don't know all these couples personally, but I guarantee you they had at least three things that kept them together for so many years. Number one, they had to be patient with each other. Number two, they had to be gentle with each other. And number three, they had to forgive one another. So here's my question for you. Do you think that God's love for you is lesser or greater than these couples love for each other? And so if the bedrock of the relationship of these couples in front of you is gentleness and patience and forgiveness, do you think that's any different with the way that God cares about you? You have been caught and an unexplainable love from God your Father. He loves you deeply. Don't run away from His love. Come near to Him. If you need anything from this church family, whether that be the prayers this morning, or whether you want to give your life to Christ in baptism, I'll invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.